The Hebgen Lake earthquake, otherwise known as the Yellowstone earthquake of 1959, is one of the most interesting and unfortunately deadly natural disasters to ever occur in the state of Montana. This earthquake was so powerful that it created hurricane-like winds that blew people's clothes off, a tidal wave that went from one end of the lake to the other that was absolutely massive, and then also a natural dam formed right in front of a man-made dam which flooded and stranded 200 campers in Yellowstone National Park that needed to be rescued. This is one of the most interesting national park stories as well as one of the deadliest disasters in Montana history. And to go along with the channel, it did happen close to midnight. One of America's worst series of earthquakes in this century, felt throughout the Northwest, centers its force on southwestern Montana. In Medicine River Canyon, 50 million tons of earth and rock, the top of an 8,000-foot mountain, thundered across a forest campground in one of the biggest landslides. Before we start talking about the Yellowstone earthquake, I wanted to say thank you. It means a whole bunch that you stopped by this video. I've been making a couple videos about pretty much everything weird in Montana. This is taking me from cow mutilations to the horrific night of the grizzlies that occurred in Glacier National Park. I put a lot of work into these videos and I have about 60 subscribers. So if you're into Montana things or just weird, paranormal, unexplainable things, it really means a lot when someone new subscribes to the channel, checks out some of my other videos and leaves a comment about what they thought. Anyway, let's get into the Yellowstone National Park earthquake of 1959. The first thing that I want to talk about is this absolutely awesome video documentary I found about the Hebden Lake earthquake. I found it on YouTube. It was a re-upload. I don't know where the original source is, but it looks like to me that it was made in probably the 1970s just because of the way it is <laughs> but it shows really good footage of what was going on it has some in-person interviews it's just absolutely incredible so i'm going to be using it in the background for a lot of this video there's also very nostalgic footage kind of reminds me of like watching a bob ross paint along with me video so huge shout out to this old documentary it's going to be linked in the description I want to build up the situation that was building around this earthquake that took place around 11.30 at night on August 17th, 1959. And then we're going to go into some of the personal accounts of survivors that were in the midst of the landslide, water rising, and the huge wave that was crashing into both sides of the lake. The Hebgen earthquake is listed as anywhere from 7.2 to 7.5 on the Richter scale. And I was really tempted to just say 7.5 because, you know, bigger number, scarier earthquake. But it looks like nowadays we consider this earthquake to be 7.2. Some people still say 7.3. Now, when looking up the biggest earthquakes in the United States, the statistics get a little messy, at least for my research purposes. Some of the earthquakes date back to the 1700s. And I remember finding one that was even earlier, which is a little bit too unmodern for what I was kind of looking for with these earthquake statistics. And then also a lot of earthquakes in the U.S. happened in Alaska, which is kind of outside the realm of the lower 48, where it would affect the majority of the population of the U.S. So was this earthquake one of the biggest earthquakes in the U.S.? Kind of. But it might not make the top 10 basically because Alaska has an earthquake every 30 seconds, apparently, if you look back at the history. Now, one of the biggest things in researching this earthquake that happened in Yellowstone is all the side effects that came along with it. I'm originally from the Midwest where we typically worry about maybe flooding and tornadoes, not necessarily earthquakes. When you get to the west side of the United States, there's, there's a lot more of them. So hearing about the specific side effects that happened in the area was absolutely mind blowing. First of all, there was a massive tidal wave that went from one end of Hebgen Lake all the way to the other. And this wave actually was a key component 
and people worrying and wondering if the Hebgen Dam was going to break, which will come up later. This massive tidal wave could be seen very clearly because it was a pretty nice night out you know, despite the disaster. Accounts from the north end of the lake say that this massive tidal wave took about 17 minutes to go from one end of the lake to the other. So imagine just sitting out there on this clear night after this disaster happened, and then you're just watching this massive wave approach you from the other end of the lake. Going along with this massive tidal wave, there was also a shift in the air. And by that, I mean there was massive hurricane-like winds that were said to blow people's clothes clean off. Now, in my mind, originally, I was like, what kind of cartoon antics is this? Some gust of wind is blowing someone's clothes off and they're just left in their boxers. Uh, what is this Wile E. Coyote stuff? But when I actually looked into some of the personal accounts, one that will come up later, shows just how drastic these winds actually were. Now alongside these gusts of winds that were super powerful was this huge roar that comes up in every story. It's pretty much how every single account starts. People hear this huge, immense noise. Now there's actually one account of a World War II veteran who said he heard this roar after seeing the mountain collapse, which he described as worse and louder than anything he heard during the entirety of World War II. Pretty freaky. The most devastating side effect of this earthquake was the 80 million ton landslide, which created a natural dam. This is still there and occurred right next to the Hedgen Dam, which meant that the canyon in between these two dams was slowly filling up with water. And many of the stories that you're gonna hear later in this video are from people that were affected by this landslide trapped in between these two dams. Now, while I was researching the landslide and just the area in general, I was getting a little bit confused in the dam placements and everything. So I wanted to make this diagram on a whiteboard so you guys can understand what I'm talking about and I can really set the scene. So people were camping all around here and just basically visiting the lake. It was a very popular fishing lake and it still is. And right here is Hedgen Dam. In my mind, when I was reading everything, I was getting kind of confused how people got trapped and how water was flooding and flowing into the area people were trapped in. This is the actual lake where the massive tidal wave was pushing through. Up here, we have the Hedgen Dam, and then past it, we have the new landslide. This landslide dam was the one where 80,000 tons of rock. Hi, it's me, Devin, and this is a little editing note. I said 80,000 tons of rock. What I meant to say was 80 million tons of rock, which is insane. I think I say 80 tons, 80,000 tons a couple times. I mean 80 million tons. Fell in between these two mountains. There was a mountain here and a mountain here, and it basically just fell, filled up with rock, creating a new dam. This dam killed and crushed certain people and then also stopped the water flow, which was coming through controlled through Hedgen Dam. But now with this new one, this area was filling up. This was the area where campers had to come to high ground where they eventually went to refuge points where they were awaiting any sort of rescue, which eventually came in the form of air rescue and helicopters. More on that later. If the Hebgen Dam broke, which it was at very high risk of doing, a huge amount of water would have flowed from Hebgen Lake through and then through the second dam all the way downstream. This downstream led to a local Montana town called Ennis. If this dam broke, Ennis would have flooded and it would have been a huge disaster. Not only was this at risk of happening, on the first night of the earthquake and the flooding and the disaster, reports came in that this dam broke. So the town of Ennis was freaking out. They completely deserted their town, they sought refuge, and left. Luckily, this dam never broke. Although it was close, and it was being heavily monitored after the earthquake, eventually it was repaired, 
and everything was all good. Also, since we're here and we have the map up, nowadays there is a visitor center right around where the landslide happened. That's not like super accurate, but just in the general area where you can learn about the landslide, the earthquake, and also see a massive boulder that fell and landed due to it. And you can see just the cliff side that is completely sheer rock that was once just kind of a normal mountain looking side. One more thing I want to mention, this area here that over flooded with water where people needed to seek refuge eventually became Quake Lake and is actually on the map now and you can visit it. It's super interesting and kind of eerie. There are little trees poking out of the water that you can see that were flooded over. Now, outside of this landslide, there was almost a hundred million dollars worth of today's money in damage to the infrastructure of Yellowstone National Park. Roads, bridges, highways, all things like that were just completely destroyed, uprooted, and there are some pretty gnarly pictures. With Quake Lake radically forming in Madison Canyon between these two dams, survivors of the initial earthquake quickly realized that they needed to get to higher ground, and they eventually settled in an area that we now know as Refuge Point. However, not everyone was so lucky. An elderly couple staying at the canyon inside of their trailer was woken up in the middle of the night. Originally, they thought a bear was attacking their trailer, pushing it around because they heard stories of bear interactions earlier in the day. Unfortunately, they quickly realized that they got caught up in rushing water. The water was rising and the initial earthquake sent water through their campsite. The rushing water pushed their trailer about 100 yards until they eventually got caught on something. It was then they realized that they were able to get on top of their trailer, but with the new Quake Lake forming, eventually the water rose higher and higher until it got to the point that they needed to abandon their trailer. Luckily, there were trees nearby where they were able to climb up the branches to safety. From 11.30 at night to six o'clock in the morning, Grover and Lillian were stuck in the tree before they were eventually rescued. The elderly couple was then interviewed and put on national TV and Lillian specifically is said to have written Christmas cards to all of her rescuers for the rest of her life, which was very sweet of her. While Grover and Lillian were lucky enough to survive the night, not everyone was so fortunate. One of the more tragic stories is the Bennett family who were staying in a trailer that they brought from Quarter Lane to camp in Madison Canyon. And during the night of August 17th, at 11.30, like many other families, they woke up to a horrendous roar. In the Bennett family, the mother and father were staying inside of the trailer camping for the night while their four sons were laying outside on bedrolls. After hearing the roar, the father of the family went outside to check on his kids, only to be swept away by the hurricane winds. According to Mrs. Bennett, he grabbed onto a tree for support, only to have his legs give out from underneath him, holding on to the tree up until he couldn't anymore, letting go and never to be seen again. Before Mrs. Bennett lost consciousness, she reported seeing cars and one of her children being swept away right in front of her eyes. Philip Bennett was swept away by the water and eventually downstream was able to cling on to some trees where he was able to burrow in some mud to try to stay warm. Philip Bennett and Mrs. Bennett were both rescued and taken to the hospital the next morning and were the only surviving members of the Bennett family. In the middle of the night on August 17th, 1959, the Stryker family was camping at Cliff Lake, about 20 miles outside of Yellowstone National Park. The family was asleep in their tent, three boys in one tent and the two parents in the other. At about 11.37 at night, the Hebgen Lake earthquake occurred, causing dust to fly up, loud noises, and trees to topple over. This caused the oldest boy, Martin Stryker, to get up out of his tent to see what was going on. The first thing he noticed was a tree laying on top of his family's Volkswagen, and the second thing he noticed was a giant boulder laying right on top of his mom and dad's tent. Realizing that if the boulder kept rolling, it would have crashed into him and his brother's tent as well. Unfortunately, this meant that his mother and father both died 
He then led his younger brothers through all the destruction and debris of the earthquake in the pitch black, hoping to find help and to get away from the situation. Eventually, those three boys were able to make it to safety, and while well, they lost their three parents, they were relatively unscathed themselves. Those were just a couple stories of the people directly affected by this earthquake, but like I mentioned previously, there was about two to 300 campers that actually survived the night by going to Refuge Point. One of those campers was John Owens, who was actually responsible for taking many of the photos of the rescue operation and of the people staying at Refuge Point. Now, relief was organized rather quickly as local government all came together to try to save the people that were stranded in this canyon filling up with water. Specifically, it was the Forest Service and an Air Force base that was located in Utah that sprang to action and sent some air relief to the National Park. It said that smoke jumpers jumped out of planes to bring early relief and some medical supplies to the people that desperately needed it at Refuge Point. And eventually helicopters and other aircrafts were allowed to land in the area and rescue people, bringing them to safety. How many missions have you flown so far, sir? In I the lost area. count. <laughs> lost count. <laughs> right. And, uh, uh, what, uh, what did you see on your first mission? I probably, probably that was the most impressive, or was it? Well, yes, the, the, um, the mission was, uh, first mission was quite impressive to see the, the extensive amount of damage done between, uh, on this side of the dam, really, uh, immediately after passing the dam and uh, uh, seeing all the trailers and everything stranded there and below the dam where we landed first to, to, because we saw the indications of uh, medical help uh, needed uh, ground signals. Well, there we landed and found that most of the people there were in uh, very good condition uh, considering and the doctor looked at the people and decided they, would, they could wait until we'd evacuate the people from up at the dam where the, they had been moved. Uh, therefore we landed near the dam and start evacuating the more seriously injured from, from the area. Uh, we got approximately uh, 11 stretcher cases and uh, two ambul ambulatory patients uh, in all. When the dust settled, 19 people were buried underneath the 80 million tons of rock that fell as a result of the Hebbian earthquake. And when all things were said and done, 28 people at least lost their lives to this natural disaster. Like the Night of the Grizzlies, it took a massive human effort to help save the victims and the people affected by this event from the local government, the Forest Service, and the Utah Air Force Base, especially those 300 campers that were stranded at Refuge Point. Today, there is a National Forest Service Center very close to where Earthquake Lake was formed. That research center still teaches to this day about the tragic earthquake of 1959 and all of the changes that was made to the terrain. My biggest takeaway from this entire event is just how suddenly something like this can happen. All these campers were mainly worried about mountain lions and grizzly bears and all of a sudden one of the biggest natural disasters in Montana happens. And so many people were just suddenly whooshed away by the waves or the winds and then 19 people ended up being just instantly buried by this 80 million ton landslide. It's, it's quite humbling and tragic that this occurred, but luckily earthquake science, that's a dumb way to put it, but earthquakes are more predictable and studied nowadays. So hopefully something like this doesn't quite happen again. Although there is always that random chance that a disaster like this can happen. One of the biggest impacts to the terrain of the Yellowstone area was actually the geysers and the hot springs, which Yellowstone is of course known for. Some existing geysers went dormant, hot springs over flooded or were completely drained, and some geysers timings were just shifted and changed. It's just crazy to me that this event had such a big impact on what Yellowstone is actually known for, aka their incredible geysers. I want to end this video by saying thank you for watching and enjoying this content. Like I said earlier, I have about 60 subscribers and we're trying to get to about 7 million by the end of this week. So help me out with that. I'm sure we can get there if we all just subscribe and share the video. But in all seriousness, I do have to say thank you to all the sources that I used. There were personal blogs, an article written for the University of Montana, which is actually where I go to school, which is kind of neat, as well as some news segments that I was able to find on YouTube. 
And of course, the old documentary that had personal interviews that I highly recommend you check out because it is just kind of a, a cozy, old school documentary that I thought was pretty interesting. And like usual, all those things are gonna be linked in the description. I appreciate you watching the video and I hope you have a fantastic day.